Gallery and Art Center. Thank you for all of You can just clip it onto your collar. Uh, thank you all for giving up this absolutely lovely fall afternoon. Uh, I'm glad to have you here. And we are very glad to have right? Lydia and Mary share their artwork and their stories of itself. Look forward to seeing that. Um, just a couple housekeeping uh, comments here. Um, we'll be starting in this gallery. And then halfway through, we'll all get up and move over to that gallery. Uh, we have a double head of this afternoon, and as soon as these thoughts are over, we start our work in session. So we'll be busy the next couple of hours. But welcome uh, to Ava, Ava Galleries. Welcome to our show. Uh, I'm going to introduce Jen Lay, our exhibition uh, uh, coordinator, and she and Neil Finnegan, our new exhibition manager, turned these galleries over in record time. We closed the show last Friday, and we're opening the show this Friday. So, Jen. Hi. Jen works because we're in the Winter Gallery, and this is all Vivian's work. And so, Vivian Bruce of Seattle, Washington, earned her BA from Bradford College in printmaking from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Mass. She was awarded the Bingham Prize to, to attend the Scowegan School of Painting and Sculpture, which helped to facilitate her experimental growth away from Nancy to imagery and a voice that more closely represented her own vision. Vivian has shown work throughout Maine and other parts of the United States. In addition to her studio practice, she ran the art program at the Breakwater School in Portland. At an age where many considered retirement, she pursued her interest in science and healthcare, graduating from the University of Southern Maine School of Nursing and as a rehabilitation registered nurse at New England Rehabilitation Hospital in Portland. She currently lives and works in Portland, Maine. Vivian states, My paintings seek to examine our place in the world, what we depend on for life as we know it, and potential threats to this. While there are no human figures in my work, it is all about being human. While the work is representational, it is abstract in concept. The paintings are asking the viewer to think about these considerations. For example, using an image of a candle flame, I contemplate the nature of fire. What is its relation to light and color, its use as a metaphor, and more significantly, its role in the maintenance of life on a macro and micro and macro level. In the end, I'm shouting out to the world, please don't take this all for granted. It is precious and fragile. And I'm also going to be introducing Mary. And so Mary's work is in that gallery back there. And so Mary Hart of Woodbury, Connecticut earned her BA from Dartmouth College. She then studied in the Beyond Shaw School of Art in London as a Reynolds Scholar. She earned her MFA from the Milton Avery Graduate School of the Arts at Bard College where she was the recipient of the Elaine de Kooning Scholarship in Painting. Mary has been a fellow at Yaddo and at the Vermont Studio Center and has received grants from the Maine Arts Commission and the Artists Resource Trust. Her work has been exhibited at the Portland Museum of Art, the University of Maine Museum of Art, Simmons College, and numerous venues throughout New England. She has taught, taught painting, drawing, and printmaking at Bowdoin and Colby Colleges and currently lives in Portland, Maine. Mary's work deals with issues of growth, damage, struggle, and beauty, linking the natural world with an inner narrative. Her small, sometimes miniature paintings and prints are intensely focused and detailed. Ours aims to form visual associations that describe not only the artist's place in the world, but also her emotional response to it. So please join me in welcoming both Vivian and Mary. Um, we're going to do this a little bit different. I'm just different than Mary. That's Vivian over there. As Vivian and I have been painting partners and friends for so long, we thought we would start by talking about each other's work a little bit, introducing each other. So different from a traditional artist talk, we just focus on yourself. Um, I got to the end of this last teaching semester at Bowdoin, and one of my students wrote me a thank you note, and she said um, that she wanted to thank me and the class for introducing her to the idea that art was a conversation. 
And I was so happy to hear that because it's been kind of a lifelong aspiration to think of art as a form of communication and that it's always involved with the community. It's not just about us doing art by ourselves. And when I think of my art conversations, the one that I've had with Vivian has probably been the longest and the deepest conversation about art. We've known each other more than 20 years, and we have been sharing images, sharing ideas, sharing recipes, sharing gardening tips, going round and round with all the things that make up a life, not just the art in the studio. When I first met Vivian, uh, we had both had experience teaching young children, so we talked a lot about teaching. She was president of Peregrine Press, which was a printmaking cooperative in Portland, Maine, that I had joined right when she was leading us very calmly into a new studio and a whole new um, expansion of the press. And printmaking was a great discovery for me, and I followed Vivian into that and was very excited to, by her leadership. Then we shared a studio um, towards the end of the 1990s. That was the first time. And when that was condoed out, we shared another studio um, out in an old mill building that was very similar to this out in uh, Westbrook, Maine. And um, always we were talking. So when we had work up and we were unsure, we would share ideas about it. Vivian would set me straight, um, try to see what was going on in my work for me when I was befuddled and couldn't. And she has an amazing clarity and intellect that she brings both to her friendships and to her own work. And seeing it here in this space is really a wonderful experience for me because I haven't seen so many um, episodes of Vivian's work all together before. And seeing it together, I get this immense sense of lightness and air that I think permeates the work, as well as her kind of affection for the physical realities of daily life. And that's something that's um, carried through, I think, in my work that we share. So I'd like to introduce Vivian to talk a little bit more about herself and her own work in her own words. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think uh, people often think making art is a great emotional experience, but there, there's a lot of decision making in your work. Um, the, the part that um, is always most difficult is coming up with your um, initial idea when you're doing a body of work. I work in discrete bodies of work, I'll um, come up with an idea and then I will do multiple paintings around that subject. And the mystery for me is where does that original idea come from? And I cannot ever explain that. Um, it might come to me in the middle of the night. Um, it might come to me when I'm waking up in the morning. It may come to me when I'm driving. But it, it's definitely something from the subconscious that, that comes up. And it's always, uh, as I said in my statement, um, there's an autobiographical aspect to my work um, in everything. But it, you won't see it. it um, but I think hopefully the emotional kernel in it comes through. And then once, you, once I've come up with a concept or an idea, then it's just executing it. And um, some of it is it's very slow for me. Um, I work my paintings slowly over time. Um, occasionally, it's, it's actually, um, I won't say rote, but it doesn't involve a lot of concentration. And, you know, I, once I know what I'm doing, I can just flow with it. And often, that's a very good time to have talk to Mary when we're sharing this video. So um, we're going to have a period of uh, questions and answers if you have any specific questions, but I just wanted to give you an idea of my uh, process. Yeah, an artist friend that you know so well because I, we rely on each other for feedback, so yeah. the suggesting I talk about specific paintings, and um, This is the first time I've seen paintings from different bodies hung in, um, instead of in, in a hole. They're integrated, which actually is wonderful for me to see. But um, some of the um, earlier work, um, Millennium Height, 
close artist friends that don't paint oils anymore. So I decided to try acrylics. It was quite hard at first. I thought I can never do what I want to with acrylics. Um, I use a sponge box and it keeps the paint wet. And so what I'm doing is I'm building up very thin layers of, of paint, but it's wet, wet paint, unlike a lot of acrylic paint because it dries so fast. Right. And one of the things I really loved about um, acrylic now is that uh, the whites don't, they never, they don't discolor at all. So actually I find the colors are more color fast than oils. So. Do you use, one more question, sorry. Do you, do you use any of the uh, slow drying or the um, no. soft acrylics or you just use the I, I, Not so much. I found the, the, the sponge box okay. that does everything I want with the, with the paint. Lisa? Um, so I noticed that some of the pillow pictures, like that one and those two, they have birds in them. What gave you that, that inspiration? Well, um, I'm giving. To be personal, your father loved birds, this is my niece, and um, I've always loved birds, I think, because he introduced them to me at a very early age. So we would go on bird walks, and he was always able to see them, and I was so young, I would look up and wonder, but I knew they were wondering. He knew I, even if I couldn't find them, I, I uh, you know, I learned to really love birds. It was a big part of my childhood, observing birds. And I noticed that you have another Queen Anne's laces. The Queen Anne's lace keeps coming up quite abstract, but yes. And um, that, yeah. A mutual friend, way such you know, a long time ago, who was sharing a studio space with Mary left the space and said, I, I really think you should share a space, you and Mary. I know you'll be really good friends and how true how true it was so Mary kind of went over our history of um, sharing spaces teaching we share that we each have um, we're tall <laughs> and we each have three older brothers we're the only we're the youngest girl so there's a you know there's a lot of common ground there and um, so we um, so Mer it's been really a, a enriching experience to share a studio space. I was a little nervous at first about how that works, and uh, with Mary, it's been very easy. There's, you know, you, you're very vulnerable when you're starting work in the beginning, and um, I always felt safe working with Mary to when she would come in and see. Sometimes we actually had somewhat separate spaces side by side. Sometimes we had a shared space. Um, you have to know when to give somebody complete privacy and keep out of their hair. Other times, as Mary said, we would be in stages of our work where we would talk about our teaching, talk about gardening, talk about cooking, all the things that you, you know, share in your everyday life. And so, um, I was trying to talk about Mary. Mary is an observer. Um, and not only an observer, but a, a, an observer in great depth. And um, some of the words I was thinking that describe Mary are um, politely provocative. She's, she doesn't take things for granted. She's a little, even she can go to being a little contrarian. Um, she's always delving in and trying to understand and going deeper. And I, I think you certainly see it in her work. There's nothing predictable or, or prescribed in the way she, she's, she's working. Um, she's, um, her, her great attention to detail and, and the thoroughness with which she, and the clarity with which she paints some of her images is carried on into her friendships and her teaching. Um, she's a very uh, loyal and thoughtful friend. Um, and I particularly like these new um, drawings because to me they capture um, the kind of, the cha there's the chaos um, that Mary is willing to look at and go into 
and at the same time, she has a very refined sensibility of in the way she approaches her life. And, and to me, that's a, a really interesting juxtaposition, and especially seeing that in, as, I, as, I now, as I know Mary. Um, her teaching, when I, I've seen, I haven't been in the classroom with her, but what always strikes me when I go and see the student work and I, and I hear about what she's done is she, on the, she's able to impart a lot of information because she knows her, she really knows what, she knows her material very thoroughly because she doesn't, she, she's, um, she's a perfectionist, you know, she's demanding of herself, she's self-critical, all those wonderful things that bring about good, you know, these kind of results. Um, so she gives a lot of material to the students at the same time as a, uh, somebody, who, a caring observer, um, she gets to know her students very well. So they aren't imitating her or doing what she says they should do. She brings out in each student what they can do that's very much within themselves, and that's a rare teaching ability. So anyway. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm never comfortable talking without stuff around me. This is kind of the art teacher in me from day one when I was teaching little kids. I always had to have materials everywhere. That was, that was integral. Um, a lot of these pieces have relationships to teaching and it's nice that Vivian ended on that. I thought I might start up with that. So I've been teaching since I was 25, and I started out um, working in paper mill towns up in the western mountains of Maine, teaching with very little training, about 600 kids a week, and um, trial by fire. And I would teach all day and then come home and paint all afternoon and evening after school, and had a lot of energy to do that. Um, I've since kind of worked my way up through um, teaching high school to teaching college, and most recently I've been teaching at some of the universities in Maine and community colleges and Bowdoin and Colby. I've been a visiting professor. And what I find most exciting about the teaching relationship is the way it feeds back and forth between me and the students. This particular body of work and this body of work both came out of things that I had done with students. This one going back to my very first year of teaching when I was 25. So I, I taught um, a hands-on art history course called Art and Culture, and it was, the idea was that art history is pretty hard to absorb, but maybe if you make the things you're learning about, you'll really understand in a more physical way what the art was about. So one of the projects I did um, with my students was a book of hours, and we did illuminated manuscripts around the idea of a book of hours. The Book of Hours is a um, medieval prayer book, basically, which breaks the day down into three-hour segments. And at every three-hour time slot, you would stop and look at this beautiful Book of Hours that was illuminated with elaborate illustrations around the borders and on the facing pages. And you would stop and meditate and think about God and spirituality. So my students would do these, um, their own contemporary book of hours, and in the process of doing that, they would find that they slowed down and they thought about time in a way that was much different than in their daily life. And I, I borrowed that idea and used it as a structure for this series of paintings. A lot of times I think when um, we set up a project for ourselves, we basically as artists set up a, a bunch of rules. It's like we're playing a game, and these are the rules we're gonna follow for that game. And that gives us a structure, and then we put the time in, and in that time, the emotion and the expression come out. But they need that structure to hang on. So my idea was to do eight paintings that follow the cycle of a day, and that far right one is dawn and morning, noon, mid-afternoon, dusk, evening, midnight is the matches, and then 3 a.m. is the last one with the seed pods here. And within that, I was thinking about what happened at those hours of the day, and I was also um, free associating, I guess. I think what Vivian said over in the other room about how where the images come from is essentially a mystery is quite true. It's like we're, we're born and bred in a certain place with a certain landscape and certain people around us, and that shapes what our visual language is, and that shapes the things that we're drawn back to again and again to use in our work. 
I grew up in the countryside in Connecticut. I moved to Maine because I love the landscape. And the natural world has always been kind of the essential thing for me that um, inspires my kind of poetic mind. Um, and the other thing is I'm very much entrenched in the everyday. So the pins from sewing, the thread from sewing, um, bones from the kitchen table, bits of broken glass that I find outside. Those are all things that are just, they're part of my, the fabric of my daily life. At the same time that I'm using these things that are very ordinary, I'm thinking a lot about um, the upheaval that I see in nature. And the paintings start with this kind of abstract, messy surface, which is very new for me. I haven't been working this way for a while. And in that kind of abstract mess of texture in the background, things start to emerge, and I start to paint these very realistic images on top. And I'm thinking a lot about the upheaval um, in the natural cycles that I see, in the uh, warming of the climate in Maine that I see, in the different wildlife that I see moving into our state, in the natural catastrophes that seem to be happening more and more frequently. So I have this great sense of nature being in a very uneasy and um, uh, critical point, and that's coming through, I think, in the emotional response to the work. At the same time, I'm thinking of all the time of personal things, too. That's all embedded in the work as well. So I brought some of my things that go with this, um, these paintings just for you to see, because it's always interesting to see how things get transformed. My um, paintings before this series were like this. So I had gotten very, very small. I was working with these little tiny images. This is just a safety pin. This is a little brown moth. And sometimes um, with even tinier landscapes. So these are little miniature landscapes. And these I'm happy to pass around. They were never finished, so they don't have any varnish on them. They're just paintings that kind of sat and, um, and were abandoned. They became lost children. Um, the panels that I work on are just birch plywood, and I put a gesso, like five or six coats of gesso on them and make them very, very smooth so that I can have a lot of control when I paint. Um, so if you, when you feel them, they've sort of polished in the surface. That? I like the panels because they're very stable and they're firm, and I can get that surface on them, which allows me to do a whole variety of things when I paint. And then people are always kind of curious about what I'm doing with uh, brushes. They think I'm painting with a brush that has two hairs in it. And in fact, no, they have maybe 20. Yeah. It's just, it's a sandable gesso. It's a gesso that has marble dust in it. So you buff it and sand it down and it's almost polished like that. That's yeah. amazing. 600 or? Uh, 600 to 1200. Yeah, around there. Yeah. Because um, 1,200 grit. These, so these brushes are a 20 over zero, for those of you who paint. A number two is kind of an average little round brush. 20 over zero is pretty fine. And these are um, liner and monogramming brushes, so they're quite long, which allows you to hold a finer line. And when I first started to paint this way, um, I was very nearsighted, and if I took my glasses off, my focal point was right here. So I see things very close up. That's my natural point of vision, and that's why I can obsess on the details of things. <laughs> you have to paint with what your body offers. So now um, I see things differently now. My vision is changing as I age, and my focal point is probably about here, so I wear dollar store glasses in various potencies to get what I want. Tiny canvas, um, I work f lap? No, I work flat on a table. I work on a desk. So again, when I was working uh, with the very small paintings, they tended to be framed in really intricate ways. So this was from a series called Lexicon. And similar to Vivian, I'm using ordinary objects. And in this series, I was putting them together in a diptych. So the two images would talk to each other. This is a um, an Easter egg wrapped in green foil on the bottom, and then um, my flies, which have been following me around for a long time, <laughs> on the top. And I was, I was intrigued by, when you just look at one, you think one thing. When you just look at the other, you think something else about Easter and sweets and things like that. And when you put them together, there becomes a dialogue. You start to have kind of a visual sentence, like a short poem. And those things affect each other, and you start to read them differently and think about them differently. So when the, piece, when the series was called Lexicon, 
that's what I was thinking about. It's how images can start to speak and have a language of their own. In this case, they start to make each other much more uneasy and a little bit um, fraught. But at the same time, I think flies are really beautiful and Easter eggs can be really disgusting. So you can think about them flipping back and forth. I still have this Easter egg, so it's gotten more and more disgusting over the years. Um, some of the other objects here on the table are actually in the painting. So um, this dragonfly here, uh, which I just found out on the grass a couple of months ago, is the dragonfly in that drawing over there behind the back corner. Um, this very prickly seed pod here is um, called Jimson weed, and it's something my mom found growing in the backyard and gave to me. And it's in the painting down here. It's the exact, it's the exact um, thing. Um, Jimson weed was really interesting to me because it was just such a fabulous plant. It's completely covered with spikes, and it had these really massive, twisted-up leaves falling off of it. Um, and then mom. My mother is not a naturalist and interested in botany, and she told me that jimson weed is a highly poisonous plant. And I found that interesting, too. And it seemed to fit really well for 3 AM, which I think of as the insomnia hour of night when we think our darkest thoughts. So there are things hidden in these paintings that you don't naturally, don't, like Vivian, there's autobiography in Vivian's paintings, and there is in mine, too. And I think people bring whatever they see in the paintings, whatever their history is to them. Um, and then I'm embedding things that have emotional qualities, which you may not understand unless I give you the whole narrative, but hopefully the emotion carries over. So the, the drawings are a separate series, and I just call them improvisations, but I think of them as um, a simpler version of what's going on in the paintings. So when I was tired of the painting and I needed to take a break and I needed to let the spontaneity back in, I turned to these. And again, they came from a project I did with a Drawing 2 class at Bowdoin. And I was just in touch with one of my students from this, the class this morning, which was really cool. She's become a gallery director in Portland at Faux Pas Gallery. Um, she just graduated from Bowdoin. And um, I did a project with them on chance and drawing. And we, we burned paper. We threw ink at paper. We did all sorts of things to create chance activity on the surface of the paper and then responded to it. And it comes out of a surrealist drawing games. Um, but for me and for them, I wanted it to be a genesis of thinking about drawing as a very open and free form way of making an image. Because we had just come off of five weeks of straightforward figure drawing, which is how I learned art at Dartmouth and at Byam Shaw School of Art. Um, but that type of drawing is very um, known. There's a prescription for it. It has a way of, you know, you learn how to get the proportions right, get the figure laid out, plan the composition. And I wanted to upend that and open up their imaginations. So I, when I started back in my studio, I thought, well, why don't I take my own assignment and do it? And that was wonderful for me because it helped me to play again in my work. And I think that's always essential to have that kind of not quite knowing, not quite sure where you're going and um, tripping over yourself a little bit and setting up obstacles that then help you to create new ideas. So these all started with some sort of blot happening on the surface. This is Kozo paper. It's a mulberry paper from printmaking. And I would, before I left the studio at night, I would pour water on the paper and pour ink and just leave it a big, wet, sloppy mess. And I would come back in in the morning, and I would have no idea what I would find, because everything was completely transformed as it dried. And like this one was very precise little dots when I left, and it all bled out. Then I would bring something into it on top that responded to it. And I think uh, what Vivian said about um, looking at chaos and thinking about chaos is, kind of the essential relationship in these, where there's a chaotic accident slash maybe uh, fertile moment happening, and then an attempt to control it. So these little rubber bands, in this case, are following this line of dots down as if somehow they could contain and control and organize it, although they never quite can. And I think that theme comes back again and again in the pearl necklaces back there in the corner that don't quite connect, but circle through that dark in a really lovely way, or that one single rubber band up there that has a huge flow coming out of it. 
and right back by Vivian, this rope that I found on the street as I was walking to the studio, um, circling around that big, massive gray blot, but not quite being able to tie it up. So I'm interested in that, that chaos is there, and it's the, uh, it's the fertile moment, it's the creative moment in our lives, which either can make things destroyed or it can make things come back together again. So that's um, a brief look at my work, and my objects are up here, and you're welcome to come see what else you can find on this table. This is one other good one. This is a, um, a volcanic rock from Italy that I found on the ground when I was doing a residency there a few years ago, and it's just such a wonderfully sharp and ugly thing, mm -hmm. and it is in that painting over there in the bottom corner. It's, um, I stayed... It was actually at a friend of Vivian's house in, um, f uh, near Farnese, Farnese, north of Rome, about an hour and a half, right on the border with Tuscany. It's a beautiful old farmhouse. It's cool. I think that's it. As well? I went to Yaddo when I was quite young, when I was about 28. Was that Yaddo was fabulous. I went for a couple months and um, uh, met. The nice thing about Yaddo is you were working alongside artists who were very uh, sophisticated and well-established in their field. I was, I was really young. And it was so interesting to be in this uh, very small group in the winter. There were 12 of us talking to Susan Cheever and Susie Gablick and David oh, Maloof right and all those folks. And they were you know, writing books and talking to me about my work and talking about putting my work in their books. And, I had just come out of the western mountains of Maine and painting a paper mill all by myself for the last two years. So I was very um, sort of young and, and naive, and it was a wonderful kind of opening up. It's a cool thing. Yeah. Amazing. And then I went back to the Vermont Studio Center do, recently. In Yano, do you all have to be painters or no, no. writers and playwrights? And all of the poets. above, yeah. Poets, uh, filmmakers, okay, playwrights. So you send you a lunch through the door or a secret You take lunch. your bag lunch with you. Yeah, they pack it in the morning, you take it to your studio, yeah. and they don't make you talk about your work or show it to anybody. It's very, like, just go and do what you need to do. And then you all meet at night for a wonderful dinner. That's right. Yeah. Very good food. <laughs> yeah. Just going back to um, Vivi's beginning of your studio experience together, um, I'm just curious about how two teachers interact um, in the studio. Do you, do you feel as though you're teaching one another, or do you... Um, if, if, if I need guidance, I ask, and I, in that sense, yes, because Vivian has such a good eye, and she's looked at work for so long, and she's so articulate. So if I'm saying, God, I don't know where this painting is going, or does this series make sense? Is it too sweet? Is it too ugly? Whatever. She can um, articulate that for me in a way that I'm, and she knows me so well that she can see into what my process is that I might have been missing. And I think that's what a good teacher does, too. It, it's been really easy, and I do think sometimes artists together can have egos that bang into each other, and Vivian and I haven't had that, so we're lucky. Isa. Are you mean this one here, yeah. Isa? Um, next to that. Well, they're actually, they're um, pieces of glass, and I think um, glass is one of the hardest things to paint, Isa, and I, oftentimes I'll paint something just because it's a really interesting challenge, and I'm not sure I can do it. So if they just look like shapes, I might not have done it yet. That might be something I have to work on some more. But I was, um, I was thinking about dawn, and I was thinking about daybreak. Okay, that's a really literal pun in there. Things are breaking in it. And I was thinking about pins as um, I did a lot of sewing when I was growing up, and pins are to hold things together, but they can also hurt if you poke yourself. So there's this thing of day opening up, which is a lovely moment in time, but it can also be a time of breaking, and day can introduce pain, because you're becoming awake and aware. So. Um, yeah. What is the wonderful quality in this? one from the end, it has the, is, is, that the, is that ink on it? Is that the paper coming through? This is, this is all the ink blot here. Mm -hmm. In the middle of it, how that, the highlights are coming out. Is that the 
Paint no, I painted this thread in it. So this is all painted. Yeah, so all of these started with a blot and then they have something painted into them. So it's like, fine, where's Waldo? You have to go up and see what oh, the object is. So yeah, I see that. all these things. The, oh, this marking in here? No, the lighter part in the middle of it. In here? Yeah. That's, that's just nice. the way the water bleeds out the, the ink. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then I think these, these things are, this is probably the most hidden one, but these things are painted on top. They come from the rope. Again, it was the idea of trying to stitch it together. So you have this thing that falls apart and then holding it together. Do you know Lily Mayer? Who? Lily Mayer? No, she I don't. Does all, she does that kind of stuff in her artwork. Mm -hmm. Is she from here or yeah, New York? Yeah, she is. She's a printmaker. OK. I'll have to check it out. I don't want to follow up the question. Uh, what is your relationship to insects? Um, <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, most of us um, avoid them if we yeah. can. But mm -hmm. you have very tenderly depicted these these insects. It's almost as though you're worried about them in mm. the chaos of the world and what's going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. the fires. You just answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> you just answered the question. Oh, I? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think. These are all um, the moths and things. Are, they, they died on the windowsill. You know, they, they died around the house, and I gathered them up. Um, I think they're incredibly beautiful, and they're moths in particular because they're so subtle. I love these little brown moths that all have slight differences in patterns and textures in them. Um, I paint this intense. Someone, people always say, well, your work looks like a photograph, and that's... It's a little bit irksome because it does look like a photograph, but it, it's, that's not why I'm doing that. I'm not doing it because I want to show off that I can paint like a photograph. It's a type of honoring of the object. I spend a lot of time with it when I'm painting it like that, and there's a tenderness in it and a sense of honoring this thing that's come from nature and also of, I guess, giving it a second life that these things have passed, and here I am recreating them, yes. giving them creative breath again. And the, the flies, um, I think I mentioned, but they just have this, in some ways they're like a stand-in for human beings because there, there's so many of them and they're so beautiful individually and then so kind of toxic in a lot of the things that they do. They're, they're maggots and they spread disease and they have all kinds of nastiness as well. So they, they have that duality that I think of with human nature. Yeah, Isa. You found them. Yep. They're flies. What did she say? She's, they're flies in this one here. She's sitting right next to it, and they're very hidden. That's good. Then I put enough in. I wasn't sure. I was thinking about it. Talk might be why is a nice girl like Mary painting flies? <laughs> <laughs> I, hmm? oh, I was just wondering if you or anyone here saw the um, exhibit at the Renwick Gallery in Washington that reopened the Renwick Gallery in even years and it was called Wonder. I, I read about it and, and my son one, went to it. Well, there was one gallery that had bugs all, all over the wall. Bugs. The walls, the walls were sort of tapestried with the yes, bugs, as I remember, and there were all kinds of patterns yes, in the gallery. Illumination, yeah, probably. I read about that piece, and I read about that whole show with great, great fascination, and I couldn't get down to Washington, D.C., but my son was visiting at that, a little after that, and he, um, he went and gave me a review of it. My attachment is just sort of personal. As I said, I grew up in the country and I spent a lot of summers. We had an old 
like a swampy pond. And when it was hot, I would just float around on a, on a little boat and read books, and the dragonflies would fly around my head. So I had this sort of, it's what I grew up with. It's what I, my mom helped me collect them and taught me how to um, you know, stick the pin in them and dry them out and do all that. Taxidermy, I learned that. We flower collections. It was my way of understanding the world, of organizing it and systematizing it. So. Did you ever hear of Damien Hirst's first book? Uh, no. Well, he was at, where was he? She's talking about Damien Hirst's first show of yeah, his work. His first show, he was very clever. I, I, I happen to know him. And he um, got some water with that stuff you put for hummingbirds, the sweet water. Oh, yeah. And he, it was in a derelict old place down on the east end of London. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got these. Now wait a minute, they're not mayflies, but they're some sort of fly that only has a 24 hour existence. A is it a, a mayfly? Mayfly is a cabbage. And so you got all these pupae, is that right? Mm -hmm. That then developed and flew up into the city. This was an oh. exhibition. Mm -hmm. And then they dragged the water and then they dropped down dead. And so the ones that were all dead all over the floor were picked up and pinned onto, just like the Victorians do, mm -hmm. butterflies. And it was a sort of cycle thing. And the clever thing about this exhibit, the kid, he was only 19 at the time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he got money from all the other kids, all the other art students, you know, 20 pounds here, 20 pounds there. And with the money, he invited all the critics to come. Oh, brilliant. And uh, he would pay for their taxis. <laughs> so they couldn't refuse. That's they great. They came in taxis. And of course, he was put on a map. They wrote wow. about him. It was so extraordinary. And that's Maybe what his whole exactly. art is about, mm -hmm. the cycle of life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like to make paintings still. I'm still, I'm not a conceptual artist in that way. I like the painted object and the, the craft of painting. I think that's why I'm reaching back to this almost like a Dutch still life tradition in these. And, but I'm trying to bring it up to our contemporary time and our needs, our thoughts now. So that, I probably talked enough, unless anybody has any other questions. I think there's a lot of art to enjoy, uh, some wonderful exhibitions on the other side of the wall there, and then uh, please feel free to peer over my objects here and see if you can figure out where they are. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.